Hello and welcome to Unheard, I'm Florence Reed. It appears that the world has entered the age of existential risk. Every week, a new threat to the future of humanity comes barreling down the track towards us. Reading the news can be, frankly, quite depressing, and I do it for a living. But someone who seemingly never tires of thinking about the end of civilization and how to avoid it is Swedish-born philosophy professor Nick Bostrom. He coined the term existential risk, is the founder of the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford, and is the author of many best-selling books on theoretical physics, computational neuroscience, logic, artificial intelligence, and many other subjects of which I have no understanding. Professor Bostrom is the most cited professional philosopher in the world under the age of 50, which may also have something to do with being one of the only professional philosophers in the world under the age of 50. He joins me live from his office in Oxford for the humble task of explaining the end of the world in around 45 minutes. Nick, a very warm welcome to Unheard. Well, thank you. Okay, so we've got our business cut out for us. <laughs> we do. It's good. I like to set the bar high to start. Let's begin by getting a definition of existential risk. What do we actually mean? Do we mean the total annihilation of humanity, the end of the world as we know it, or do we actually mean something closer to civilizational collapse? The concept of existential risk uh, it basically means ways that the human story could end prematurely. Um, that might mean literal extinction. Uh, that's one way we could end, but it could also mean getting ourselves permanently locked in to some radically suboptimal state. That in turn could either be collapse from which we never recover, or you could imagine some kind of global totalitarian surveillance dystopia that you could never overthrow. And if it were sufficiently bad, that could also count as an existential catastrophe. Uh, now, as for collapse scenarios, uh, m many of those might not be existential catastrophes because you might imagine, you know, uh, civilizations have risen and fallen, empires have come and gone, and like, but eventually, maybe even if uh, our own contemporary civilization totally collapsed, perhaps out of the ashes would rise eventually another civilization hundreds of years from now or thousands of years from now. Um, so for something to be an literal existential catastrophe, it would not just have to be bad, but the badness would have to be uh, lasting uh, indefinitely. A state of kind of semi-anarchy does feel that it's almost already descended. Perhaps that's too extreme, I, but, well, okay. but it does so, feel I mean, a little like that. Yeah, I, I think there is like a general sense of um, many people have in, in recently, in the last few years, that sort of the wheels are coming off a little bit, or maybe they haven't fallen off, but they're sort of rickety and things like institutional processes and long-term trends that were previously taken for granted. Like this is the modern world with, there's still wars, but they're gonna be fewer and fewer every year. And there's still, there's still a lot of ignorance, but the education system is gradually improving. And I think, th the, the kind of faith people had in those assumptions have been shaken over the last five years or so. Somebody plays Russian roulette once and survives, you shouldn't draw the lesson that Russian roulette is not dangerous. They, they should just thank their lucky star that that they survived that first round and, and make sure they never play it again. But, but I, I don't think we have kind of invested in building robust global conflict uh, resolution institutions or, or developing norms, et cetera, that, that could help. Trust in global institutions as well seems to have fallen significantly because of the handling of things like the COVID pandemic by these global institutions, which was in many cases so disastrous that the individual has, has lost all interest in following the guidance of a kind of world economic forum or, or its equivalent. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole COVID thing was was a big, uh, I mean, yeah, they, they certainly didn't cover themselves in glory, the uh, World Health Organization and, and and many other authorities, I should say, also kind of uh, burnt a lot of their uh, credibility. Your your people did very well. The, uh, yeah, the there, Swedes there were, seemed yeah, to be. Um... My, yeah, but um, but then even more. Okay, so we get this big pandemic. Some big institutions who ought to know better sort of scramble around and and like and, and do a bunch of bad things. Okay, so it's a hard challenge. But then you might at least think after it's happened that there would be some sort of lessons learned. Um, and that we would, you know, prepare ourselves for m another pandemic that could happen at any time from natural causes or because of biotechnology making it easier for evildoers to conquer. But, um, but it, it seems like as soon as this was over, people just lost interest. And so there is still gain of function research going on without any more safeguards than there was before in different places of the world. 
open publication of the most dangerous viral recipes. Your books, you write a lot about the way in which it's going to become increasingly necessary for us to learn from each existential threat as we move forward and to try and create mitigation methods so that the next time when it becomes more severe or more intelligent or more sophisticated, that we can actually cope with that. And that specifically, of course, relates to artificial intelligence, which is something that of course we have to cover here. It must be astonishing to you to have the subject that you've dedicated decades of your life to studying suddenly becoming a household conversation topic, something people are debating over the dinner table. I mean, it's quite striking how radically the public discourse on this has shifted, even just in the last six, 12 months. Um, having been involved in the field for a long time, um, you know, there were people working on it, but broadly in society, it was more viewed as a sort of science fiction-y speculation like kind of you know not not really uh, part of mainstream concern or certainly nothing that top level policymakers would be and but now we've had i mean just here in the uk this recent global ai summit you know the white house just came out with executive orders there's been quite a lot of talk in, including about existential potential existential risk from ai as, as well as as more near-term issues that is kind of striking I, I i think that technical progress is really what has been primarily responsible for this. People saw with, um, you know, GPT-3, then GPT-3 and a half, and chat GPT-4, and like just the, the delta between these, like how much even just within a couple of years, this technology has improved and it's so general purpose, like the same AI system can, you know, write, write poems or, or program computers or, or answer questions about history or anything. and. So, so these very large transformer models seem to have this general capacity to learn. And if they are big enough and have enough data, they also seem to be able to uh, learn to reason more abstractly about all this information. How close are we to something that you might consider a kind of singularity or AGI that does actually in some way supersedes any human control over it? Is that something that is in the near distance or is that a long way away? It's something that we can't any longer uh, be confident is not in the near distance. So as far as we can see now, there is no obvious clear barrier that would necessarily prevent systems next year or the year after from reaching this level. It doesn't mean that that's the most likely scenario, but we don't know what happens as you scale GPT-4 to GPT-5 level. It, because we know that when you scale it from GPT-3 to GPT-4, for example, it unlocked new abilities. Um, there is this phenomenon of grokking, so that initially you try to learn some task and it's too hard for the AI. Maybe it gets slightly, slightly better because it sort of memorizes more and more specific instances of the problem. And it, it, but, but it's like the hard, sluggish way of learning to do something. And then at some point, it kind of gets it. Like once, once it has enough neurons in its brain or has seen enough example, it sort of sees the underlying principle or, or develops the right higher level concept that enables it to sort of suddenly have a rapid spike in performance. And we've seen as we have scaled up these uh, large language models that that sort of each new order of magnitude of scaling has unlocked new capabilities that um, and, and we don't really know what will happen if we add orders of magnitude that it might unlock further capabilities, perhaps enough capabilities to make these systems uh, capable of long-term planning or capable of really high quality research into AI that, that could then create feedback loops and so on. I thought Grok was an interesting name for X or Elon Musk to choose for their AGI, considering that it has such a human implication. It's about intuition or gut feeling to Grok something is to really understand it in a human way. I wonder if they're purposely trying to align the machine here with an idea of human sentience or understanding. It feels like in back rooms of places like X and at the University of Oxford, these two things are, are, are much closer than we might think. I, I think probably closer than most people think. Or I mean, you really need to think in terms of probabilities, uh, but, but there should be more probability mass on nearer dates than most people think. But I think perhaps the, uh, the bigger difference between, say, what I would think and what the average person would think might more not so much be about how many years between now and this thing are there, but more like when this thing happens, like how radical will that be or how quickly would things unfold at that point? Like once you get to something that can 
say, substitute for humans across, uh, you know, half of all human jobs or something like that. I think some people model this as then, then maybe the next year it will be like 52% and then 54% and then over, you know, a lifetime or two, you might gradually get to complete automation. I, I think that second phase will be much compressed and that you like, once it really starts to happen, I think people will be surprised about just the, the speed at which this uh, unfolds, absent deliberate measures to slow it down. Right. And my assumption is that there will be a company, one of these major companies, whether it's OpenAI or X, who makes the first leap and then the others will follow very quickly. There's a bunch of different ways that this could go and it partly depends on, on the kind of what, what policymakers think should be done as well. Um, so at the moment, it's still a very open and competitive field with some, some number of big players and then startups uh, that are sort of vying to, to also join the frontier. But it's possible that if uh, what is required to get cutting edge performance is increasingly large data centers to run these. Like, so we've seen a very rapid increase in the amount of spending on compute required to train this system. So like five years ago, maybe you could get by with like a hundred thousand dollars of computer or something or like, but now you're probably like in, in you probably need like a, probably billions. I mean, at least a billion dollars worth of Nvidia chips or something to sort of be able to train a cutting like a, a, the, the next level of model and, and 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 a couple of years from now maybe that will be 10 billion um and so at that level it's going to decrease the number of players that could participate at at the frontier right you have basically a small number of really big tech companies and then potentially governments and and even governments for many that's got to be too big an expenditure and for others they are not going to necessarily uh, have access to the nvidia chips because of export restrictions M maybe it's not a government run project but a project that the government has a lot of oversight into which for some people would be deeply worrying and for others reassuring so one one current debate is whether it is good or bad for these current models to be open sourced so facebook open sourced the llama 2 model which is a little bit behind the frontier, it's not quite as good as GPT-4, but it's still a powerful model. And um, others are saying that this is irresponsible, or at least that it would be irresponsible to sort of open source the next generation and the next generation after that. Because it could fall into the wrong hands. Is that the logic there? Well, at the most basic level, so these big tech companies, they want to limit what their models are used for. So. Uh, they try to prevent them from, say, assisting users to commit cybercrime or to uh, do or say various bad things. But once somebody has access to the uh, um, parameters of the model, they can usually uh, retrain it in such a way as to sort of eliminate whatever safeguards were in the original model. This is where we come up against this misalignment of values that you write about, the idea that we have to begin to teach AI at the earliest stages a set of values by which it will function if we have any hope of kind of maintaining its benefit for humanity in the long term. One of the values, the liberal values that has been called into question with when it comes to AI is freedom of speech. There has been examples of AI, chat GPT, the early forms of it, effectively censoring information, uh, filtering information that is available on the platform. Do you think that there is a genuine threat to freedom and a kind of totalitarian impulse built into some of these systems that we're going to see extended and kind of uh, exaggerated further down the line? I think AI is likely to greatly increase the ability that, uh, say, um, some central power would have of keeping track of what uh, people are thinking and saying. Um, so right now, I mean, we've had for, for a couple of decades, I guess, the ability to collect huge amounts of information. I mean, you could sort of eavesdrop on, on people's uh, phone calls or, or uh, social media postings, and it turns out governments do that. But what can you do with that information? I mean, so far, not that much. You can sort of map out the network of who is talking to whom, um, and then 
if there is a particular individual of concern, you could assign some analyst to sort of read through their uh, their emails. With AI technology, you could sort of simultaneously analyze everybody's political opinions in a sophisticated way, like like sentiment analysis. You could probably form a pretty good idea of what each citizen thinks of the government or the current leader um, if you had access to their communications and with even present day AI tools. You, you don't have to have much imagination to imagine how that could be sort of useful to particular people or regimes. And, and then on top of that, you will then be able to customize responses. So you could have sort of mass manipulation, but instead of sending out sort of one campaign message to everybody, you could have a tailor-made, customized persuasion message to each individual. Um, Advertisers are already yeah, using and, this. And then, and then, of course, you can combine that with sort of physical surveillance systems, like with facial recognition and gate recognition, and then, then all of this information going into one, and credit card information. And, and like, if you add in all of this information, and, and the communications feeding into one giant model, I think you will be able to have a pretty good idea of what each person is up to and not just what they have done, but also what and who they know, but also like maybe what they are thinking and intending to do. And so the upshot of this might well be that, I mean, it will take a while to shake out because there's a lot of inertia in these and, but, but like eventually it might just be, there are like some scenarios in which you get the kind of lock-in so that current political systems uh, become uh, imperturbable. Like, like if you have some sufficiently powerful regime in place, it might then implement these measures and then perhaps make itself immune to overthrow. That does feel a little like what we've seen in the last few years in China. People have lived in sort of highly censored societies and, and often what develops is a kind of folk feeling for, well, we know they are lying to us and uh, we are not talking about it, but wink, wink, notch, notch. And, and there is like a kind of, and I, th I think people are, can become over time quite sophisticated at sort of seeing through official propaganda narratives. Do you think the, the rise in hyper-realistic propaganda, deep fake videos, what AI is going to make possible in the coming years, will that coincide with a rise in skepticism, generalized skepticism? like you're talking about in the Chinese example, do you think the average American or English or Swedish person is going to become hyper-skeptical? I think that in principle, society could adjust to that. But I think it will come at the same time as a whole bunch of other things with sort of these uh, automated persuasion bots, like social companions built of these large language models and then with visual components that might be very compelling and addictive perhaps, uh, like and compete with social companionship and then these mass surveillance, mass potential censorship or propaganda and, and also mass education. Like you could also have like individual tutors. I'm, I'm just talking a lot about the negative. We know from the past, I mean, going back all the way, like when people invented writing, so that then enabled states to form because you could keep tax records, etc., and like a huge change in how human societies were organized politically. Then like with a printing press, another big change. Um, that you know ultimately maybe enabled a sort of modern democracy and stuff but also like a hundred years of religious wars when, when people like started forming their own opinion and came to different conclusions with social media i think i think we're also seeing quite a lot of turbulence and then when this gets ai powered it, it might kick it up a notch further is there a distinction between a bad use of ai so in those examples we're talking about a tyrannical government who uses ai to surveil its citizens versus a kind of innate moral component to the AI itself. Is there a chance that an AGI model could in some way become a bad actor on its own without human intervention? Yeah, so there are um, a bunch of different uh, concerns that one might have as we move towards increasingly powerful AI tools. And, and like one like completely unnecessary uh, feud that people have had is like, well, I think concern X is should be uh, taken seriously and somebody else think I should, I think concern Y should be taken seriously. And then, then like, well, but X, well, what about Y? And then it's like, people love just to form tribes and to, to beat one another, like any, any excuse to just form a little tribe that you can. But I mean, I, I think like both X, Y, Z and B and W like need to be taken. It's just such a big thing that there are going to be many aspects of this that need to be addressed. So yeah, so one, we were talking about sort of these tools of AI and how they might shape political systems. And this applies even just with current 
AI tools uh, for surveillance, etc. But yeah, so then, then you're right. There is also this separate uh, alignment problem, which is with an arbitrarily powerful AI system. How could you make sure that it does what the uh, the people building it intend for it to do? And this is where we're, it's about building in certain principles or uh, what you might call a kind of ethical code into the system from the off. Is that the way of mitigating that risk? Well, yeah, or being able to steer it, basically. Uh, I mean, it's a separate question of where do you steer it? If you could build in some principle or goal, like which goal or which principle, but, but even just having the ability to point it towards any particular uh, outcome you want or set of principles you wanted to follow. That is a technical problem um, that is hard. And in particular, what is hard is to figure out a way that we would be able to do that would continue to work even in these scenarios where the AI system becomes smarter than us and perhaps eventually radically super intelligent and where we are no longer able to maybe at that point understand uh, what it is doing or why it is doing it uh, what's going on inside its brain we still want this original like scaling method to to keep working to arbitrarily high levels of intelligence and 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 we might need to get that right on the first try so that so no pressure no pressure no nope, no pressure in western liberal democracies or what might be considered western liberal democracies we have a lot of values that are in direct conflict with a kind of utilitarian way of living we think about welfare caring for those who are at the bottom of society, those who might not be able to contribute for some reason or another, children prior to working age. If a, a, a model was created to just maximize utility, you can imagine already the kind of what the potential outcomes of that might be. And I think for many people, that is the existential fear is that the computer brain would have a naturally more utilitarian bent than the human brain, which in these liberal democracies likes to think about in some way, not maximizing utility and maximizing efficiency, but rather thinking about how do we best live in a common society with a common good, which are quite wishy-washy concepts when you actually dig into them. I think there could be like two ways in which this, so on the one hand, um, you might object in general to this consequentialist maximalizing approach, which I think makes sense to object to. I think that doesn't capture everything that we uh, should care about in ethics. But then there's like an additional problem is even if you did assume that it, there's something that should be maximized, we might not be able to spell out exactly what that is, let alone give that set of instructions to a computer without sort of forgetting or leaving out a bunch of important things. Of course, like if you ask someone what value do you want to organize a society around, they might say mm, family, family. Well, of course, a machine that constantly spouted out children would not be <laughs> a good family, but it would certainly be a creator of family. If you were worried about antinatalism and, and, and lower birth rates in your country, like somewhere like Japan, you might ask your computer to create something that maximizes for family. But already you can see how the concept of family to us as humans is so distinct from just an idea of pumping out babies all the time. One aspect of that um, problem, I think, will get easier more or less automatically. Like there is a set of failures that would result from, you know, imagining the AI not really to get what it is that you were meaning. And it's like fixating on the letter of the instruction or something. But there, as the AI becomes uh, more uh, capable, I think it will be able to understand not just the words, but the intentions behind the words. Um, and things like what we would maybe have added if we had thought about it longer or if, if and stuff like that. And, and at, I mean, at least at the level at which a human is able to do that, but probably much better. Um, the question then is, <clears throat> like, will it be motivated to pursue uh, this understanding that it is maybe developing about what we truly would want on reflection. That can be hard to do. I mean, like to, just to make it very simple, like you might sort of like a, a, a typical way that you do things is you, you train it to do some task and then you say it like give it thumbs up when when it did it the way we wanted and thumbs down when it did it some other way. And that can work well during a certain regime when we can tell whether the outcome was good or bad and where we remain in control to give it a thumbs up and thumbs down. 
But then you start to wonder whether what it really learns is to do the thing that we want, or it starts to learn the thing that it thinks will result in getting thumbs up. And now when the AI is limited, this might make no difference because we did give it thumbs up in exactly those cases where it did what we intended because we understand what's going on and we are in control of the reward mechanism. But if you then try to generalize this to a, a future situation where the AI is in control or is smarter than us or whether when it's doing something so complicated that we can't tell whether we should give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, then it might matter a great deal whether it was kind of learning to do the things that triggers humans to give it thumbs up or whether it was learning to do the thing that we really had in mind. And it can be really hard during training to make sure that you sort of uh, teach it one thing rather than the other. So, so that, that's an example of how, how like there are many techniques that work now uh, perfectly well for aligning these AI systems and but that we have reason to think will systematically fail as they get situationally aware or uh, when, when they find themselves in a position where they no longer are dependent on, on human approval, where they would be able to sort of short circuit that process or delude us. Would this not inevitably lead to a situation where we have an ubermensch class at the top of society who access super intelligence before everyone else, and that compounds because the super intelligence allows them to access even higher forms of super intelligence so none of the rest of us can keep up? Well, yeah, and, and it might not require any implantations at all, but just having access to the leading edge systems when other people don't have access, just for advice or like like asking for strategy to achieve something. Um, initially, probably some subset of people will have that and may, maybe it will be some people in the AI labs or maybe it will be the US military or intel like some sort of group who have appointed themselves to, because surely somebody needs to test it out a little first before we can give everybody access, but then there's an interval during which they will have access to maybe super uh, intelligent advice that would place a lot of weight on 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 the, the quality of the like the trustworthiness of these individuals or institutions what whatever exactly is the form of that 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 uh, that, that has kind of uh, early access the grave existential risk that we're all facing this week is is war of course in the middle east in that situation you do have a very stark contrast between the almost medieval warfare tactics of Hamas and the incredibly hyper modern warfare of Israel with the iron dome and the incredible technological capabilities how is ai going to play into future wars is it already playing a part in this conflict we're seeing in Israel i certainly think militaries will be very interested in developing ai powered weapon systems and and integrating it in in their operations um, so far, I think they have been lagging, in, like the cutting edge AI is not in some Lockheed Martin research group, but it's That's like... That's probably a relief, actually. <laughs> yeah, but um, but as, as I think as the strategic uh, significance of this technology becomes more obvious to people, there will be an increased clamoring from, from sort of military intelligence establishments to, to have more control uh, over this. I would expect that that will happen increasingly as time goes by. If it is true that it will have these tremendous strategic and security implications, it's, it's hard to see that that would not be a, a kind of, that, that, that it would all be just left to some non-profit or cap profit Silicon Valley group of a few hundred people to sort of do what they please. Like I, I, I'd imagine um, people who, who, who currently hold more powerful positions in those uh, domains would, would want to get their hands on this as well and have have oversight of it. Do you think we're ready for the intelligence explosion? Are we properly prepared or are we underprepared? No, no, no. And I mean, I don't think we'll ever, I mean, I think it's a little bit like we are in some plane and we realize there is no pilot or the, the pilot has had a heart attack and died. And so now we are the passengers so we've got to try to land this, right? And, uh, um, it's harder because we don't have sort of a ground control that is like giving us instructions. So we have to, we, we see a big, big instrument panel, right? And uh, there are like a few people in the cockpit kind of looking at all of this. And like they, you could look at the fuel gauge and we've got some time left in the air, um, like a limited period of time before this arrives. And we got to sort of figure out how to bring this, uh, this, this bird in for a safe landing. How do we do that with such incredible levels of dispute and ideological schism across the world it feels like without a kind of central body who's dealing with the ethics of this 
we're going to very quickly get into a situation where different polar axes of the world are developing this stuff in a kind of space race style competition, but with their own ideological messaging and values built into it, which feels like such an existential, such a clearly existential threat. How, what would be the first step in the kind of Nick Bostrom global program to, to, to mitigate the risk of that? I, I mean, I, I, th I think there are like a few things on the margin and then like if, if, if wishes were uh, horses or whatever, like the ideal world. But on the margin, I think even a toothless, but like affirmation of the general principle that ultimately AI should be for the benefit of all, all sentient life, at least. Um, it's too big to be, uh, like if we're talking about super intelligence, like, like obviously if somebody's making a cool little app or something that could benefit from that in the way that they benefit from any other consumer thing that they're doing. But if we're talking about a transition to the super intelligence era, all humans would be exposed to some of the risk in this, whether they want it or not. And so it should seem fair that all should also stand to have some slice of the upside if it goes well. Um, and I would say this principle should even go beyond all of currently existing humans and also include, for example, animals that we are treating very badly in many cases today. And and also the uh, some of the digital minds themselves that might become moral subjects. And so I think as of right now, I think like all we might hope for in that demand is like some general vague principle that affirms this and then that can sort of be firmed up as we go along. So that's one thing. Um, I think another ask uh, is, and that's it's got some recent progress has been made on this as well, is for um, the next generation systems to be um, tested prior to deployment to check that they don't lend themselves to uh, people who would want to make um, biological uh, weapons of mass destruction or, or massive cybercrime thing. And uh, so far, AI companies have sort of done some voluntary work on this. OpenAI, before releasing ChatGPT4, like had the technology for more or less half, half a year and like did red teaming exercises too. And I, th I think like making that more of a requirement um, uh, seems quite robustly good. Research on technical AI alignment seems good uh, to solve the problem of scalable alignment before we have super intelligence. Um, I think the whole area of the moral status of digital mind will require more attention, and it's going to be it, that's that's now where the, the 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 alignment problem was like 10 years ago, like outside the Overton window. A few people are talking about it, but it's like seems slightly silly. Like if you imagine having a meeting with a PM or, or like somebody like you would not like, oh, well, what if the AI has moral status and is like that? That's it's like a kind of yeah fun thing to think about. But I actually think it needs to start to migrate from that kind of philosophy seminar topic to to where alignment is now, which is like a serious mainstream uh, it's going to have to be with, built into policy and politicians yeah, yeah, are going to yeah. have to I mean, think we, about we how they're going to deal like, with it. Yeah, we, we don't want to have a future where the majority of, of of sentient minds are digital minds and they're all horribly oppressed and like basically like pigs in, in animal farms or something like that. That that would be one way of creating a dystopia. And it it's going to be a big challenge because it's already hard for us to extend empathy sufficiently to to animals even though animals have eyes and faces and can squeak and are much more similar to like if it were an invisible process in a big uh, data center but a sentient that, invisible process yeah, but then, yeah like i mean it's got to be harder like um and i think incidentally there might be grounds for moral status besides sentience like i think that might be a sufficient if, if somebody can suffer, that might be sufficient to give them moral status. But I think even if you thought they were not conscious, but if they had goals, extend a, a conception of self as an entity persisting through time, the ability to enter into reciprocal relationships with, with other beings and humans, I think that might also ground various forms of moral status. Often in this conversation, it turns back to the human. We worry about our the risk to us, the risk to our freedoms and liberties. I suppose there we have to ask the question of what would it be like to live in a world where you coexist with sentient beings who are not human? And what, what might that be like? I mean, the only thing I can think of it that would be akin to it would be an alien invasion in which then we were living alongside an alien species, perhaps even stranger than that. Yeah, except in, in the case of AI, we get to design the alien species that we're going to share the world with. So that is a potentially crucial 
difference. I want to know, I suppose, on the flip side of this, do you have hope for, we've talked about a lot about the risks, for the rewards of this. If we can design these aliens who we're going to coexist with for the next hundreds, thousands, millions of years, how best could we do that? What is the kind of upside of this? What would be the best case scenario? I think the upside is enormous. And in fact, my view is it would be tragic if we never developed uh, advanced artificial intelligence. I, I think um, I think it's a kind of a portal through which humanity will at some point have to passage um, that all the paths to really great futures like ultimately lead through the development of of, of machine super intelligence. But that this actual transition itself will be associated with major risks and we need to be super careful to get that right. Um, but I've started slightly worrying now in the last year or so that we might overshoot with this increase in attention to the risks and downsides, which which I think is welcome because before that this was neglected for decades. We could have used this time actually to be in a much better position now, but people didn't. But anyway, so, so it's starting to get more of the det attention it deserves, which is great. And it still seems unlikely, but less unlikely than it did a year ago, that we might overshoot and get to the point of like a permafrost, uh, like some situation where AI is never developed. Like a kind of AI was... nihilism that would come from yeah, being so yeah, afraid. Yeah, it becomes that... so stigmatized that it just becomes impossible for anybody to say anything positive about it. And then... And then we get one of these other lock-in effects, like with the other AI tools from surveillance and propaganda and censorship and whatever the sort of um, orthodoxy is, you know, at five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever, that that sort of gets locked in somehow. And, and we then uh, never take this next step. I think that would be very tragic. And I still think it's unlikely, but certainly more likely than like even just six or 12 months ago. If you just plot the change in public attitude and policymaker attitude and you sort of think what's happened in the last year if that continues to happen next year and the year after and the year after that then i mean we we'll pretty much be there like as a kind of permanent ban on ai and i think that could be very bad um, I, I still would think we need to move to a greater level of concern than we currently have but I, I would want us to sort of reach the optimal level of concern and then stop there rather than just kind of con We're getting continue. to like a Goldilocks level of fear yeah, about AI yeah, I'm, I'm the sweet spot. It's like a big wrecking ball that you can't really uh, control in a fine-grained way. Like people are, people like the moving herds and like they get an idea and then, you know, you know how people are. I, I worry a little bit about it become a big st sort of stampede to uh, uh, say negative things about AI and then it just running completely out of control and, and sort of destroying the future in that way instead. And we don't, and then, then of course we go extinct through some other method instead, maybe synthetic biology without even ever getting at least to roll the die. With so it's the, a bit uh, of a pick your poison. It just so happens that this yeah, poison yeah, yeah. might cure yeah. you or poison you and you just have to kind of roll the dice on it. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, I mean, there's like a bunch of stuff we can do to improve the odds and the sequence of different things and um, stuff like that which we should do all of those. Being a scholar of existential risk, though, I suppose puts you in the category or the camp of people who are often, this show being an example, asked to speak about the terrifying hypothetical futures that AI could draw us to. Do you do you regret that focus on risk? Yeah, I could maybe, I, because I think now that there was this deficit for decades. It was obvious to me at least, but it should have been pretty obvious that eventually AI was going to succeed. And then we were going to, be confronted with this problem of how do we control them and what do we do with them and that that's going to be really hard and therefore risky um and 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 that was just neglected uh, like, like there were like ten thousand people building ai but like five or something thinking about how we would control them if we actually succeeded at and so but now 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 that that's changed and and this is recognized so i think there's less less need now maybe to add more uh uh to the sort of concern bucket. The doomerous work is done and now you can go into the yeah, more silver I mean, linings. It's hard because it's like, it's always a wobbly thing and different groups of people have different views and there are still people dismissing the risks or not thinking about them. And it, I, I would think that actually the optimal level of concern is slightly greater than what we currently have. And so I, I, I still think there should still be more concern. It's more dangerous than most people have realized, but I'm, I'm just starting to worry about it then kind of overshooting that. and. The conclusion being, you know, well, let's wait for uh, like a thousand years before we do that. And then, of course, it's unlikely that our civilization will remain uh, on track for a thousand years. And uh, so we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. I mean, we, we uh, will hopefully be fine either way. But 
I, I, I think I would like the AI before some radical biotech revolution. Um, so if you think about it, if you first get some sort of super advanced synthetic biology, that might kill us. But if we're lucky, we survive it. And then maybe you invent some super advanced molecular nanotechnology, and that might kill us. But if we're lucky, we survive that. And then you do the AI. And then maybe that will kill us. Or if we're lucky, we survive that and we get utopia. Well, then you have to get through sort of three separate existential risks, like first the biotech risks, and then plus the nanotech risks, plus the AI risks. Uh, whereas if we get AI first, well, maybe that will kill us. But if not, we get through that, then I think that will like handle the biotech and nanotech risks. And so the total amount of existential risk on that second trajectory would sort of be less than on the former. Now, it's more complicated than that because we need some time to prepare for the AI to actually. So, but, but you can start to think about sort of optimal trajectories rather than like a very simplistic binary question of is technology X good or bad? We might more think like on the margin, which ones should we try to accelerate, which ones retard, you know, and 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 you get the more nuanced picture of the field of possible interventions that way, I think. Do you have existential angst? Do you, does this play on your mind late at night when you're sitting in bed? Well, late at night, I'm usually still in my office working. I'm a sort of a night owly person. Uh, <laughs> I could have guessed that. I think I could have yeah. guessed that. I mean, it is it is weird to be. I mean, if this if this worldview is is even remotely correct, that we should happen to be alive at this particular point in human history, so close to to this fulcrum or nexus, right, on which the giant future of Earth originating, Earth originating intelligent life might hinge, and and out of all the different people that have lived throughout history, or all the later times that might that might be people at if if things go well, that that one should sit so close to this critical juncture. That that seems a bit too much to be a coincidence, uh, maybe. And then then you're led to these questions about the simulation hypothesis, etc. I think there is more in heaven and on earth than, than is dreamt of in our philosophy and that um, we understand quite little about how all of these pieces fit together. With that, I will leave you to get back to your very important work trying to put some of these pieces together, at least a few of them. Thank you, Nick Bostrom, very much. Oh, it's great talking to you. That was Professor Nick Bostrom of the University of Oxford. I felt a little torn there towards the end. Nick was espousing the value and virtue of a future with artificial intelligence after 45 minutes of telling me exactly how it could bring an end to humanity. It feels like a confusing future, but he thinks one that's worth digging into rather than turning away from. He cautioned there as well of herd mentality, a revulsion at the idea of an artificially intelligent future, that we must keep our eyes on the prize, which is a good version of this inevitable acceleration. Thanks to Nick for joining me, to you for watching. This was Unheard.